I'm sitting here is, well, as a history student and living in Stellenbosch University, being at Stellenbosch University, it's just a little piece of history that is on campus, that's tangible, that you can touch. And I think the important thing to remember about history is that it's written by the victors. History is always written by those who have won. And so everyone else's story gets lost in between the spaces where nobody's listening. And for me as an historian, the most important thing to do is to listen to other people, to listen to other South Africans and know their little stories around, uh, along the way and how those little stories match up to make a bigger picture, a bigger web of what the whole picture is. So you can see a little bit more bit by bit as you hear more people's stories. And that for me as being a South African is piecing this post-apartheid, post-conflict society together in this weird entangled web of history. I grew up in the Eastern Cape. I first learned how to speak, but I was brought up by the nannies around me and the woman in the laundry where my parents worked. And so they so taught me to speak, but they taught me to speak closer. So I knew very, very little English. Look, when you were born, we were living in a very different situation. We'd moved from Johannesburg to the Eastern Cape. And one of the things I liked most were the incredible people there and I got very involved with them. And then because I was so involved with work and things and not able to spend as much time with you as I would have liked, you became very much a part of a, a community of black women who ran the laundry. And you learnt about things that I don't think my contemporaries even knew. I can remember as a sort of 16 month old, pulling your, your bottle out of your mouth and saying, Nancy Madiba. I said, no, it's Mandela. And you said, mm-mm, it's Madiba. <laughs> and I don't believe that my contemporaries knew that his nickname was Madiba, and that was what you were sitting around talking about with, with women. And, uh, and you were a major toy toy at that stage, <laughs> too. <laughs> As time goes on, certain things happen that you don't necessarily they, they don't always sit well, and, and they're difficult experiences. I, one of the most difficult things that I've been through, um, when I was 14, I was raped. It's, it's a difficult experience to go through, and I think that for many people and for many women in this country, it's something that is quite common. It occurs fairly often. So. What I want to explain to you today is that although this is my line and my story and how I understand this experience based on this juncture, this, this, this point of contact, this point where two stories cross, I don't know this line and I don't know this story. And so there's very little judgment I can place on this line without understanding it, which is a very difficult thing to admit, but to understand that we don't always know how the world around us or the people around us are acting. Hello, how are you doing, Hi. Sarah? I'm good, and you? Good, thank you. I found out that I had a sister in matric. Now, my sister Sarah, her story is something I find quite typical of, of post-apartheid, post-conflict society. What happened was that my dad, Kevin, was married to someone before he was married to my mother. And she have had an affair just before her and my dad got married with a Zulu man. But my dad did not know this. When she fell pregnant, he thought that he was having a child. So nine months later, a kid was born and my dad, his whole world was obviously shattered. He, he had this kid that obviously wasn't white and therefore wasn't his. And in 1980, during the midst of apartheid, this was very clearly not legal. 
So what they did is took her overseas. They took Sarah overseas and gave her up for adoption. And they signed a legal death certificate back home. They told everyone that she died. So when I was in matric, my brother Nick, who was born of that same marriage from my dad and his first wife, Nick got a phone call telling him that he had a sister. Sarah, um, I wanted to ask, what was your first reaction when you found out that you had this brother, Nick? Wow. Um, I, was, I was shocked first. I didn't know that Nick existed. I thought I was just, uh, I thought I was an only child. Um, so yeah, when I went to the adoption agency and I opened this file and, and a picture of this little blonde boy fell out and I said, who is this? And they said, that's your brother. And I was, yeah, it was, it was amazing. Like my, my first thought was, I want to meet him. Um, and then, yeah, and then lots of other stuff came out too. I remember that dad didn't want to tell me that Sarah existed. And you kind of told him that he had to. Because one of the values that I feel that I've very much brought up with incredibly strongly and very much from you is honesty. Mm. Well, I don't, I've never been able to understand why people would lie or why they'd build up levels of their life based on lies, because where do you stop? Families fall apart when lies and deceits become part of how we deal with problems in a post-apartheid South Africa. I know that my mom found it incredibly difficult to forgive my dad for lying, and my dad found it very difficult to admit to this thing that in the beginning wasn't his fault and he'd continued to lie to protect someone that at the time he had loved very much. So my parents at the end of the year ended up getting divorced. What was your reaction when you found out you had another brother and a sister? <laughs> Horror. No, I was... Um... <laughs> It was, but it was awesome. It was just, um, but it was scary too because, you know, like, obviously Nick is my, my blood brother, my half brother. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's you and Ben and I didn't know what, I didn't know if you guys knew about me. I didn't know if you, you'd known all along or what. So it was, um, I was apprehensive, yeah. You know, for so long I'd been denied and, and rejected and, and whatever. So to be welcomed so warmly and with so much affection and love from people who really had no need to do that was was pretty incredible, yeah. When I went into university, I came to Stellenbosch. And Stellenbosch was incredibly different. I found myself in a world where it seemed that it was liberal versus conservative. I had so much to learn in terms of letting people have their own space to, to understand their values and, and the world that they've been through according to conservative values. Where for me, the world was liberal and gay was okay and abortion was a woman's choice and a million other things that just kind of fell into this, into this realm of white Christian conservatism that was Afrikaans speaking and not a world that I was ever a part of before then. Louis, I've never actually asked you, why did you come to Stellenbosch? Uh, it, it was actually awkward. It was, <laughs> it was very awkward because I had to choose, I knew what I wanted to do and I thought of the most challenging place to go. And I was like, yeah, why not? Stellenbosch, let's go, let's do this. Why do you think it's challenging? Um, it's got a really intense history. Like, you can't, you can't run away from that. It's this gorgeous place in the middle of the wine farms. Is, two very different types of people who live here. And then there's that thing about apartheid and what Stellenbosch means and it's Afrikaans. I think the way in which I grew up um, kind of formed a very particular African identity in me, which was not always very inclusive or very broad. Um, I think it has been very particularly Afrikaans, which is not a bad thing in its own. Um, but since I came to university, I think that has broadened quite a lot. So I kind of realized that 
this can be much more diverse, um, that I don't have to feel that as an Afrikaans woman, that I have to fulfill certain roles as a woman or as a white person or as an Afrikaans person, that it's really something that can be more than that. And made me, I think, not just more tolerant, because that's a very negative word actually, but really curious about people who are not like me. And that is also an immense freedom for me. Um, I think the majority of Stellenbosch isn't liberal or conservative. I think they're in a, in a mindset of not caring. You know, they don't really look at things that critically and they don't really think, oh, there's these things happening, you know, oh, this is wrong, you know, there's discrimination, we must do this and stuff. Um, but I think in general, South Africans feel like we don't have control over our country, um, especially the white middle class group. And that's why they sort of stop caring about what's happening and they stop questioning things because they feel like they don't really have an impact anyways. It's very easy for us to kind of stand outside and be like, oh, Stellenbosch is this place where nobody mixes. But when you actually have conversations, people are much deeper than you give them credit for. Much deeper than you give them credit for. They are trying to transform in their own rights, at their own time, in their own speed. So yeah, it is quite a complex relationship. One of the things I know you did is you worked with Black Sash, which largely works with women. I was wondering, like our generations are incredibly different, and I was wondering if you felt that during apartheid you did enough or knew enough to do something. Um. No, um, I, I think I didn't do half enough, and I think most of us didn't. And I think, in fact, a lot of the people who pretend, who say they did, didn't do as much as they now um, put forward, quite frankly. But um, I think that I, I probably did what I could in terms of my limitations, in terms of the, the uh, um, parameters of my family, perhaps, and my society. I probably was as involved as I probably, as, as much as I could be. You know, if I look back on myself now, I don't think I always made my voice heard. Um, but I think very much the work that I do at the moment is trying to empower people who actually haven't had a voice. And the likes of you and I who have had incredible privileges, we have the responsibility to try and encourage people and empower people and assist people. And we only do that through respect and trying to engender respect. How do you see your place in South Africa and as a South African or an African? Um, I, I see myself as an African, um, even though I feel like I don't expose myself to as many cult different cultures as I should. Um, I see myself as an Afrikaans slash English per person. I, when people ask me what language I speak, I say I don't know, you know, what am I? <laughs> um, and I look around at our differences and the different cultures and the people in South Africa and it makes me happy, it makes me feel like I'm home. Um, I see myself as South African because I see the challenges that we have as a country and it makes me excited to be able to contribute to solving them. Um, I see myself as South African because when I go overseas, you know, I speak about my country and it makes, makes me happy and yeah. For me, being an African comes down to the fact that I feel, I feel African in my soul. Um, I feel that my beat of my drum kind of like is, goes with the, with the earth and I really feel that um, my heart is held in the hands of Africa's people. And I don't feel that the color of my skin has anything to do with it. I feel that my cultural identity is so firmly linked to my roots. Um, and that for me is Africa and it will always be my identity. I know that you said to me that when you first arrived here, it felt like home. Yeah. I want to know what made South Africa feel like home and what makes you feel like a South African and an African? I just always felt that connection, even as a, even as a child. Um, now, that, now that I consider South Africa home and its people and the, you know, the land that I stand on when I go home, it's even more so for me. Um, and it's almost inexplicable, like I, I don't know what that is. But it's like, you know, when I came home to see you guys at Christmas and I, I was sitting on the, on the plane and a guy said to me, are you coming home? He could see I was texting you on the plane. He said, are you coming home? And I said, yeah. 
And it, yeah, I said yeah. yeah. And the minute, <laughs> the minute that the, the minute that the plane landed, it's like it's like a plug going into a socket. It's like that's that's it for me. And it I, it's hard to explain other than you know it's yeah it's, it's almost inexplicable. I think it's a it's a pulse. You know, like it's a it's a it's a beat. It's a sense. I don't know. It's an energy almost. It's so important to tell stories. It's so important as a South African, as an African, to sit here and tell you my story and to tell you what I've learned and where I've come from. I think we make this mistake in South Africa in thinking that our truth and reconciliation process is over. The more we talk and the more stories we tell, the more we learn and we grow about each other, the more we move towards that reconciliation. Truth needs to be told and I think every single person in my life, every, no matter what sort of experiences they've come from or what their lines look like, at the end of the day, so many of those people hold honesty as a value, hold love as a value. And to tie those all up together at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's kind of what you need for us to move on, to, to face up to the challenges we have in South Africa and to, to learn and grow and, and know that Whatever your conflict is, whether it's about gender or whether it's about race or sexuality, identity, at the end of the day, we need to talk about it and we need to tell our story.